Days. The National Broadcasting Company presents Great Plays, a series of famous plays selected to show the development of drama from the sunrise performances in ancient Athens down to the contemporary theater. Today we present Les Bourgeois Gentium by Molière, the tenth drama in this Great Play series. Mr. Burns Mantle, outstanding American drama critic and known throughout the country for his yearly volume of Broadway's best plays, will act as commentator. Mr. Burns Mantle. Fellow playgoers, we are moving back to France today to bring to you the greatest comedy genius of this age, if not of all ages. This would be Jean-Baptiste Poquelin, who, as Molière, a name he took to save his family's pride, dominated the French stage during the reign of the resplendent Louis XIV. The humanness of Molière is, to me, an engaging characteristic. I like to think of him as a sort of patron saint of little theater groups the world over. His beginnings were very much like those of hundreds of other amateurs born with an unconquerable love of the stage. He was the oldest of ten children, and from the time he was old enough to walk and talk, he was a family mimic, a comedian by instinct. His father and mother were content to let him exercise this talent until they caught him imitating the village priest. Then they spanked that particular number right out of his repertory. Molière's father was a valet de chambre to, to the king, and it was expected that Jean-Baptiste would succeed to his father's position at court. But the boy rebelled. He wanted to act. He wanted to write. He wanted to work in and around the theater. He and his friends organized one of the first of the neighborhood play-acting groups in theater history. They played for nothing on a tennis court and drew fine audiences as long as they played for nothing. When they thought they were worth it, they charged admission, and the audiences dwindled. So they went touring, much as our jitney players are touring today. For 12 long years, Molière and his followers played through the provinces of France. When finally they did get to Paris and were permitted to appear before the king, failure threatened them again. They wanted to show his majesty and the court how grand they were. They gave a performance of a tragedy by Corneille. The reading was pretty terrible. Molière quickly sensed the temper of the court. Stepping before the curtain, he asked the king if he would be good enough to keep his seat while they played one of their little country pieces. His Majesty was kind. Moliere and his troop played a farce about a doctor in love and the King Lord. In fact, it put His Majesty in such good humor that he then and there invited the Moliere players to come to Paris and settle down. Later, he turned the Petit Bourbon Theater over to them. For the rest of his life, the great Moliere was a power in the theater world. He wrote from one to four plays a year. He was author, actor, and director and he continued a great favorite at court. The play we are to hear today, Le Bourgeois Gentillon, or The Would-Be Gentleman, is one of the last farces written by Molière, and one of his outstanding successes. The first performance was given at the Chateau de Chambord in 1670. Molière himself plays Jordan. But close your eyes and suppose we go on to the Chateau. The court is even now assembling. <laughs> The king is entering the grand ballroom. He makes, he makes his way with members of his court up the grand stairway where chairs have been placed for them on the first landing. Across the end of the ballroom, opposite the king, a curtain has been drawn. This is probably the first use of the picture frame stage as it has come down to us today. The orchestra is playing music composed by Baptiste Lully. Le bourgeois gentilhomme being interspersed with ballets, songs, and choruses might be called the first musical comedy. The entire action of the play takes place in the palatial residence of Monsieur Jordan, a Parisian merchant of great wealth and great social ambition. Monsieur Jordan is determined to become a gentleman. With his money, he plans to buy courtly manners and a cultural polish. Now they are drawing the curtain. On the stage are a music master and a dancing master waiting to give the old gentleman his first lesson. The music master is speaking. Now you musicians, enter this hall and remain there until Monsieur Jordan comes in. Oui, oui, oui. And will you dancers and singers step into this room and wait until I call you? 
Is your composition finished, Monsieur Music Master? Yes. Is it something new? Yes, it is a little air for the serenade that I have just had my pupil compose while we were waiting for Monsieur Jordan to wake up. You will hear it soon with the words when he comes. Our commissions are so few nowadays that we are lucky to have found a man like Monsieur Jotin with his good income and his visions of aristocracy and gallantry. Yes, but I should be glad if he knew more about the things we are trying to do for him. True, he knows little, but he pays well, and it is this easy money that our arts need more than anything else. Well, as for me, I confess I feel repaid a little by fame, and that I enjoy applause. For it is a torture to perform before unfeeling blockheads. I agree with you. I too like praise. Nothing pleases me more. But a man cannot live on applause. Something more solid is necessary. The best praise is silver. <laughs> to be sure, our patron is far from cultured. But his good money makes up for his poor judgment. And this ignorant bourgeois is more help to us than the refined count who introduces us here. There is something in what you say. Father <coughs> Fash. Here sorry. comes, Monsieur Jordan. I'm sorry to have kept you waiting, gentlemen. But it's because I am to dress today like a person of quality. And my tailor has sent me some silk stockings that I thought I could never get on. We are here to await your pleasure, Monsieur. I beg you both to stay till my tailor brings my dress coat. I want you to see how I look at it. We will do so with pleasure, Monsieur. You will then see me dressed in the latest style from head to toe. But now to business. Uh, will you two kindly explain to me uh, why I should take up the study of music and of uh, dancing uh, and what I can gain thereby? Without music, monsieur, one cannot hold his place in the fashionable world. Eh? Without knowing how to dance, a man would know nothing. Eh? Will you see what we have arranged for you? Yes, sir. Uh, it is a little attempt which I made some time ago to express different passions in music. Uh, very well. Uh, go ahead. Come, musicians, your song. You must imagine that they are dressed like shepherds. Why always shepherds? One sees nothing but shepherds everywhere. When one has people converse in music, it is necessary that one adopt the pastoral style. It is scarcely natural that princes and the highly born should sing their fashion. Enough, enough. Uh, let us hear it. Come, your song. What is clear of the midnight? Shining in the sun, the mellow brown, where we be bright, blue and bright, full of light skies, are beaming. Mirrored in the waters there, the future seems more fair. But the rain is going to rain, the rain is going to rain, the rain is going to rain, the something elegant in the little ballet I have prepared for you. Well, that is to be given soon, I hope. The person for whom I wish all is prepared is to do me the honor of dining here very soon. But this is not enough, monsieur. A person magnificent as you are, and with your taste for beautiful things, should have a musical concert at his home every Wednesday or Thursday with dancing. Do people of quality have these? Yes, monsieur. I will have them then. Uh, by the way, dancing master... Uh, teach me how one should bow to a marquise. I shall need to do so soon. A bow to a marquise? Yes. A marquise whose name is Doramain. Give me your hand, monsieur. No, no, no. You have only to do it. I will remember it very well. Very well, sir. Observe me closely. If you wish to salute her with much respect, you must first make a bow backwards. So. And then step towards her with three reverences forward. So. So. So, and at last, lower yourself to your knees. <sighs> Thus. Ah, good. I shall remember. Lackey? Uh, yes, monsieur. No, no, my other lackey. Uh, monsieur Jordan. Well, what is it? Uh, your master of fencing is waiting in the anteroom. 
Let him enter. Uh, yes, monsieur. Gentlemen, I want you to stay and see me take my fencing lesson. And with the foils, Lucky. Yes, monsieur. Uh, this way, monsieur. Ah, thank you, thank you. Ah, good day, monsieur, your dad. Oh, fencing master. Ah, I see you are ready. Yes. Um, come, monsieur. Uh, salute. Uh, your body erect. Ah, uh, lean slightly on the left side. Yes. The legs not so far apart. Uh, your feet on the same line. So. Uh, your sword opposite your shoulder. Uh, don't hold your arm so stiff. Ah, uh, better. Uh, head erect. Uh, eyes firm. Now, so. Uh, lunge. Uh, body erect. Uh, steady. Uh, touch my sword, Anka. Mm. Uh, one, two, recover. No, no, lead back. Uh, body well back when you make a thrust and sword thrust out. Uh, one, two, ready on terrace again. Advance. Uh, uh, steady. Uh, uh, advance. Uh, steady. Uh, advance from this front. Uh, one, two. Uh, recover. Uh, repeat. Uh, leap back. Uh, parry, monsieur. Parry. Oh, you do that marvelously well, monsieur Jordan. I have already told you the secret of fencing consists in only two things. To give and not to receive. And it's impossible for you to receive a stroke if you know how to turn the sword of your enemy with a little movement of the wrist. So. Uh, in that way, a man with uh, no courage at all is sure of uh, killing his enemy without being killed? Yes, yes. It's in this that one sees how far the science of arms excels all the other useful sciences, mm -hmm. such as uh, uh, dancing and uh, music. Speak of dancing with respect, pray. Learn, I pray you, to speak better of music, too. You are both ridiculous uh, to wish to compare your small sciences with mine. Uh, behold a ridiculous animal with his pad. Behold a little man of importance. My <laughs> little dancing master, I will make you dance in the latest style. So, uh, and you, my little musician, I will make you sing in a beautiful manner. So, uh, Peter of Iron, I will teach you your business. Are you mad to quarrel with a man who understands how to kill by practical demonstration? I scorn his practical demonstration. Uh, I'll free you. Uh, you impudent! How oh, great! Yeah, oh, oh, I will call you, gentlemen. I, I will teach you. you in a way that will. Oh, I, I will teach you. My head is teaching you how to talk. I know, I know. What have we here? Oh, master philosopher, you are just in the nick of time with your philosophy. Come and make peace between these people. What is it, gentlemen? They're quarrelling about their professions. They have said hard words to each other, and and they're about to come to blows. Oh, indeed. Oh, need one get out of temper in this way? And have you never read the treatise Seneca composed on anger? But, monsieur, this fencer comes here and insults us by decrying dancing and music. A wise man is above any insult which may be addressed to him. They are both audacious in wishing to compare their professions with mine. It is necessary for you to get stirred up about it. It is not of a vain glory and social position that men ought to wrangle. That which distinguishes one from the other is wisdom and virtue. I maintain to him that dancing is a science to which one cannot pay enough honor. And I, that music of all the sciences is the one which the ages have revered. And mm. I, I maintain to both that the art of fencing is most beautiful and necessary of all the arts. Oh, and what then must philosophy be? You are all very impertinent to give the name of science to the miserable calling of the gladiator, the <laughs> fiddler, and the juggler. Oh, go beat each other as much as you please. I'm not going to spoil my robe to separate you. Come, Monsieur Jordan. Will you will you have your lesson now? Oh, my dear Monsieur. I am sorry you have been so maltreated. No, that is of no consequence. The philosopher knows how to accept such things in a proper spirit. But uh, never mind. What is it you wish to learn? Uh, all that I can. For I have every desire in the world to become learned. And where do you wish to begin? Well, uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, will you teach me... Um, uh, uh, orthography? Oh, so you wish to learn how to write well, eh? <laughs> well... Well, the letters are divided into vowels and consonants. The vowel A is formed by opening the mouth wide. A. A. The vowel E is formed by drawing the jaw up somewhat and partly closing the mouth. A. 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 <laughs> How wonderful. Mm. <laughs> the vowel I, by dropping the jaw still more than the A, and rounding the corners of the mouth a little forward. A. -E. 
呀，哎呀，哎，龙的嘴，那包 always formed by opening the mouth wide and rounding lips forward. Oh, oh, you're right. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> What a fine thing it is to know something. <laughs> the vowel U is formed by bringing the teeth close to each other without allowing them to close. You, you, <laughs> how cute! <laughs> the lips are drawn up backward, as if you are making a mouth. When, if you wish to mock someone, you have only to say, "You, you." <laughs> how much time I have lost! <laughs> Ah, how fine it is to have an education! <laughs> Later, I will explain to you the consonants and all their peculiarities. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> and now, uh, I must tell you a secret. I am in love with a woman of quality, a marquise, and I want you to help me write her a little note, which I shall drop at her feet. Ah, you wish to write a poem to her? No, no, no,、uh, not poetry. You are only going to write prose? No, I don't want prose, and I don't want poetry. It must be one or the other. Why? For the simple reason, Monsieur, that there is no way to express oneself except in poetry or prose. There is nothing but prose and poetry. Nothing. All that is not prose is poetry, and all that is not poetry is prose. Oh. And when one speaks, what is that? That is prose. By my faith, I. I have spoken prose for more than forty years without knowing it. <laughs> I am greatly obliged to you. I should like then to say in the letter, a beautiful marquise, your beautiful eyes make me to die of love. But I want it expressed in a more gallant manner. Well, one could say first, beautiful marquise, your beautiful eyes make me die of love. Or, your eyes beautiful with love make me beautiful marquise die. Or again, die. Your beautiful eyes, beautiful marquees of love, me make.、Uh, but of all these ways, which is the best? Beautiful marquees, your beautiful eyes make me die of love. Oh, my way! <laughs> Yet I have never studied, <laughs> and I did that at the first stroke. <laughs> I thank you with all my heart, and I pray you、uh, come early tomorrow. It is well. <laughs> Good day, Monsieur. Good day. Good day. <laughs> Lackey? Yes,、yeah, Monsieur. No, no, my other lackey. Yes, Monsieur.、Uh, yes, Monsieur.、Mm. I just wanted to see if you were about. Yes, you may go. Yes, Monsieur. My coat hasn't come yet, has it?、Uh, no, Monsieur. That confounded tailor keeps him waiting all day, and I have so much to attend to. Oh, I'm furious. Hurry, hurry, Monsieur Dan is waiting. Ah, here you are, tailor. I was just about to get angry at you. You kept me waiting.、Uh, I could not come earlier, Monsieur. I had twenty apprentices at work on your coat. Here it is. No.、Oh. What is this? You have embroidered the flowers upside down. You did not say you wished them otherwise. Are such orders necessary? Oh yes, to be sure. All people of quality wear the flowers upside down. Oh. oh. Very well then. If you wish, I would have them changed. No, no, no. Do you think the coat will fit me? What a question! I defy a painter with his brush to make a closer fit. Will you put on your coat? Yes. Give it to me.、Uh, wait, not that way. I brought an apprentice with me to dress you in the proper manner. This kind of coat must be put on with ceremony. Boy,、oh, yes, Monsieur. Put this coat on, Monsieur, in the manner that you do the same service for people of quality.、Uh, yes, Monsieur.、Uh, monsieur, if you please.、Uh -huh. ah, ah, oh, there! It is a beautiful coat.、Uh, my lord, give me some money for drink, if you please. What is it you call me, my lord? My lord. <laughs> See, Taylor, what it is to dress like a man of rank. You always dress like a tradesman. No one will ever call you my lord. There is silver. Oh, Monseigneur, I am greatly obliged to you. Monseigneur. Oh, Monseigneur. <laughs> Wait, my friend. Monseigneur deserves something. It is not a little word. Here,、yeah, this is what Monseigneur. It gives you. Oh, oh! Thank you, sir.、Uh, we're going to drink to the health of your highness. Your highness? Oh, 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 oh. by my faith, if he calls me your Majesty, you will have my whole purse. <clears throat> There, 
This is for my highness. Oh, thank you. Now, uh, leave me. Uh, your highness, I thank you most humbly for your liberality. Good day, uh, your Good day, your highness. Good day. Good day. Ah, how pleasant it is to be a gentleman. Grand Ballet and Dance. Comte Durant has promised to bring the ravishing Marquis. But first, Cleance and his valet, Coviel, arrive. They are both in a temper because of the way they have been treated by Lucille Jordan and Nicole, who meets them in the salon. Nicole? Yeah, monsieur. What is it? Oh. Listen. <laughs> what are you laughing at? Excuse me. <laughs> What's the matter with you? Oh, great heavens. <laughs> what an idiot. Are you making fun of me? Oh, oh, no, monsieur. I should be sorry to do that. <laughs> I'll box your ears if you laugh anymore. Oh, monsieur, I can't help it. Stop it. <laughs> if you laugh again, I swear I'll slap your face. Oh, oh well, monsieur, I'll not laugh anymore. Now, listen to me. I want you to get the house ready for the company that will soon be here. Ah, by my face, I no longer want to laugh. Your company so upsets the house that the word is enough to throw me into a bad humor. Am I to close my door for everyone, for you? You ought at least to close it to certain people. My husband, what have we here? You make yourself most ridiculous, rigging yourself out this way. Do you want everyone to make fun of you? No one but fools, Madame Jordan, would laugh at me. Indeed. For a long time, your absurdities have been the butt of sensible people. I no longer know our home. One would say that it was carnival time every day. It's squeaking a violin, screaming and dancing, so the whole neighborhood into a turmoil. Be quiet, I say. You ought rather to think of marrying off your daughter. She's of an age to be provided for. Don't you worry. I shall think of marrying my daughter when a proper suitor presents himself. But I wish also to learn the beautiful things. I hear, madame, that he has taken today, as an addition to his soup, a lesson from a master of philosophy. Yes. I wish to learn how to converse with people of quality. What I say is good, sound, common sense. You ought to make up your mind to turn over a new leaf. I ask you, what are the words that you are saying now? Good, sensible words. Your conduct is scarcely that. I don't mean that. What do I say to you now? What is it? Stupid nonsense. No, not the matter, but the manner. What we both say is the language we talk now. Well, well. What is it called? Whatever one wishes to call it. It is prose, stupid. Prose? Yes, prose. All that is prose is not verse, and all that is verse is not prose. See what it is to study. You're a fool. Since you've taken it into your head to mix with the nobility. When I visit the nobility, I show my good sense. Far better than always being with common people. Yes, yes, truly. Especially with Monsieur Comte, with whom you are infatuated. Stop it. You don't know what you're saying. He is a person of greater importance than you think. A lord who stands well at court and who talks with the king just as I talk with you. Oh. Is it not a great honor that he should come here so often and call me his dear friend and treat me as if I were his equal? Oh, yes, yes, yes. He does come here and he flatters you, but you lend him money. It is enough to know that if I lend him money, he will return it to me and with interest. You expect that? Assuredly. Has he not promised? I know he will not. Monsieur le Comte Durand. Monsieur le Comte Durand. Be quiet. Here he is. This caps the climax. He comes, of course, to ask for the loan. Quiet, I tell you. Uh, this way, Monsieur le Comte. Oh, my dear friend, Jordan. How do I find you today? Very well, Monsieur. And ready to offer you any little service. And Madame Jordan, how is she? Madame Jordan is very well, I thank you. Monsieur Jordan, you are most elegant. You look splendid in that costume. Indeed. <laughs> Turn around. <laughs> Ah, you look quite gallant, monsieur. <laughs> silly behind as before. My fate, monsieur Jordan, I have been strangely impatient to see you. You are the man whom I esteem most highly in the world, and I was speaking of you only this morning in the king's presence. Oh, you do me much honor, monsieur. In the king's presence, now, mark that. I am your debtor, as you know. Only too well. You have generously lent me money on several occasions, and you have obliged me with the best grace in the world. Monsieur... 
You are pleased to favor me. But I know how to return what is lent me and how to repay favors. I do not doubt it at all, monsieur. I wish to settle with you. And I have come here that we may figure up our account together. Oh, well, see how impertinent you were, wife. I am a man who likes to clear up his debts as soon as possible. I told you so. Uh, let us run over what I owe you. Uh, you uh, remember clearly, no doubt, all the money you've lent me. I uh, believe so. Uh, I made a note of it. Um, yes, 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 yes. Um, let's see. Oh, uh, some total is um, 5,900 livres. Uh, the sum total is correct. 5,900 livres. Just add 200 pistoles that you will give me today. That will make just 19,000 francs that I will pay you uh, uh, at an early date. Did I not know your man? Hush. It will not inconvenience you to let me have this. Oh, no. <laughs> I have many friends who would gladly lend me this amount. But as you are my best friend, I thought that I would do you a wrong if I asked this favor of another. You, uh, you do me great honor, monsieur. I shall go and uh, get the money. Uh, Madame Jourdain, your daughter, where is she? I do not see her anymore. Mademoiselle Lucille is very well where she is, monsieur. I should think, madame, that you must have had many lovers in your youth, charming and gracious as you are. So? Huh. And is Madame decrepit? And does her head shake now? Ah, madame, I ask your pardon. I did not notice that you are still young. Huh. I am often absent-minded. Uh, there aren't... Uh... Here are your 200 pistoles. I assure you, Monsieur Jourdain, I am wholly yours, and that I am eager to render you a service at the court at any time. Oh, I am deeply obliged to you. And if Madame Jourdain wishes to attend an entertainment at the Royal Palace, I shall have the best seats in the hall reserved for her. Madame Jourdain is your humble servant. <laughs> ah. And now, Monsieur, our beautiful Marquise, as I told you in my note, will soon be here for the ballet and the dinner. Oh, and I have finally won her consent to accept the diamond ring which you sent to her by me. Oh, how did she like it? Marvelously. <laughs> and I am greatly deceived that the beauty of the jewel does not produce an admirable effect on her attitude toward you. Oh. <laughs> I am in the greatest confusion to see a person of your station humble himself by doing these things for me. Oh, you are taking the right course to touch her heart. Women like, above all things, to have money spent on them. Soon you shall have the pleasure of seeing her. Oh, uh, in order to be quite at liberty, I have arranged to have my wife dine with my sister where she will remain for the evening. Ah, you have acted wisely, as your wife might have embarrassed us. I have given your orders to the cook. The ballet we are to present is of my own invention. And if my ideas are adequately carried out, I am sure that it will be found... <laughs> what do you hear? Eavesdropping? You are very impertinent! Let us withdraw, Monsieur Lecomte. Faith, madame, my curiosity has cost me dear. Uh -huh. But I think there is something in the wind. They are talking about some affair where they do not wish you to be. Oh. It is not the first time, Nicole, that I have suspected my husband. If I'm not very much mistaken, he has some love affair. And I shall leave no stone unturned to ferret it out. But first let us consider my daughter. You know Cleon's love for her... He's a young man whom I thoroughly admire and approve, and I wish to aid his suit and give him Lucille if I can. Oh, indeed, madame. I am most delighted to hear this. For if the master pleases you, the valet Corviel pleases me nonetheless. Oh. <laughs> and I wish that our marriage might take place in the shadow of theirs. Oh, good. Then go tell Cleon for me that he may come now, so that together he and I may ask Monsieur Jourdain's consent to his marriage with Lucy. I will run, madame, with joy. I could not receive a more agreeable command. I am going, I think, to make several people happy. <laughs> On the evening of the dinner, Nicole meets Cleant and his valet, Coviel, just as they are entering the salon. Here you are, just in time. I am a messenger of joy, and I was going... Away, uh, perfidious uh, one. Away, I say. And tell your famous mistress that never in her life shall she abuse the two confiding Cleon. What is this, my poor Coviel? Tell me what all this means. Wretch, get out of my sight and leave me in peace. What? You are angry with me, too? Get out of my sight, I tell you, and do not speak to me, never, so long as you live. Well, I never. What has happened? 
This is a fine story to tell, my lips. They are treated as shockingly, Master. I show for a woman all the ardor and all the tenderness imaginable. I love nothing in the world but her. And behold the recompense of such devotion. I have gone two days without seeing her. Then I meet her by chance. My heart is transported. I fly with ravishment toward her. And the faithless one turns her eyes from me and passes abruptly as if she had never known me. And I have been treated in the same way. Can anyone find anything, Coquille, to equal the perfidy of the ungrateful Lucille? And that of the wretch, Nicole? After the many ardent sacrifices, sighs and vows that I have made to her. After the many services I have rendered her in the kitchen. She flies from me in disdain. She turns her back upon me with impudence. It is perfidy. Worthy the severest punishment. This is treason. Advise me, I pray you, never to speak to her again. Aye, sir, never. Never make any excuses to me for the actions of a faithless woman. Never fear. Stand by me and sustain me in my resolution so that my vengeance will be the more terrible. To hate her, to jilt her, however beautiful, however full of attractions uh, I may find in her. She is here. I will not even speak to her. I will imitate you. What is trouble, Crayons? What ails you? What is the matter with you, Coviel? Oh, what ugly spirit possesses you? Are you dumb, Crayons? Have you lost your tongue, Coviel? How despicable! How Judas-like! Oh, I see that the meeting a little while ago troubles you. Ah, Coviel, they see what they have done. Mm, our greeting this morning has made them suddenly angry. They have guessed where the shoe pinches. Is it not true, Crayons, that this is the reason of your displeasure? Yes, perfidious one. Well, indeed, you make a great fuss over nothing. Let me tell you, Cleon, why I avoided you this morning. I will listen to nothing. Oh, I want you to know, Corviel, what made us pass you so quickly. I will hear nothing. This morning, no. Cleon... No, my ears are sealed. Oh, well then, since you will not listen, keep your ugly thoughts and do as you please. If you will act that way, do just as you like. <clears throat> well, let us hear their reason, Corviel. Yes, well, you see, if you had listened to me, I would have told you that the slight of which you complain was caused this morning by the presence of an old aunt who believes that the mere approach of a man dishonors a girl, who perpetually reads us sermons on the subject, and... There! Who... Behold the secret. You are not deceiving me, Lucille? Oh, well, there is nothing truer, Cleon. That is just how the matter stands. Uh, shall we give in to them, Cleon? Oh, Lucille... How a word from you can allay the pain of my heart. <laughs> oh, my Nicole! <laughs> oh, darling! Cleon, I'm glad to see you. Ah, oh, madame. You are here at a fortunate time. My husband is coming, so take this opportunity to ask him for Lucille's hand. Madame, how sweet that word is. Could I receive a more pleasing command, a more precious favor? Ah. Oh. Uh, Cleon, uh, good day, monsieur. I, I do not wish, monsieur, to have anyone make the request for me which I have so long meditated. It touches me closely enough for me to make it myself. <laughs> so, uh, without more ado, I shall ask the honor of being your son-in-law. Before making any reply, monsieur, I must ask you if you are a, a gentleman. <clears throat> uh, monsieur, uh, most people in my position would not hesitate long at that question. The term gentleman is used very lightly today. As for me, I consider it cowardly to attempt to disguise my station. I was born of a father who held honorable offices, and uh, I have a sufficiently large fortune to hold a passable rank in the world, but with all that, I do not wish to make pretensions to a name which others in my place would not hesitate to claim. Uh, hence, I say to you frankly that uh, I am not a gentleman. Then, monsieur... My daughter is not for you. What, what is this? You are not a gentleman. You shall not have my daughter. And what do you mean, pray, by gentlemen? Are we, monsieur, descendants of Saint Louis? Hold your peace, Madame Judah. I see what you are aiming at. Are we not both descendants of shopkeepers? Nay, kick the woman. If your father was a merchant, so much the worse for him. As for mine, they are slanderers who say that of him. All I care to say to you, Monsieur Cleant, is that I wish to have a gentleman for my son-in-law. My daughter shall be a marquise. And if you say anything more, I'll make her a duchess. Good day. <laughs> Cleo, do not lose courage. And come, my daughter, come with me and say resolutely to your father that if you cannot have Cleo, you will have no one. Yes, come along. 
well, you have made a mess of it, Master, with your fine sentiments. Well, uh, I have scruples on this point that can scarcely be overcome. You belittle yourself to deal with such a man. Don't you see that he is mad? Can you afford to sacrifice yourself to his whims? You are right. But I had no idea that one would have to give proofs of nobility in order to become son-in-law to Monsieur Jourdain. <laughs> what are you laughing at? Oh, I think... That just came into my head to fool the old man and win his daughter. How? <laughs> oh, the idea is superb. <laughs> what is it? <laughs> well, a short time ago, yes. I saw a masquerade which will serve our purpose now. We will perform it here and will carry the day for us, trick the old man, and win a wife for you. Yes? He will enter into the nonsensical business with zest and play his role to perfection. I have the actors and the costumes already. Only uh, give me a free hand. Yeah, but tell me, I'm careful. Uh, here he comes. I'll tell you the whole scheme later. Uh, uh, let us go out this way. What the devil is the matter with those women? They have nothing to reproach me with but a love for the nobility. And to associate with aristocrats is my highest ambition. I would gladly have two fingers cut off this hand to have been born a count or a marquis. Monsieur, here is Marquis Le Comte. Accompanied by a lady. Good gracious. Uh, bring them in here. I have some orders to give. Uh, tell them uh, I will come. I mean... Yes, monsieur. Uh, monsieur, this way, sir. Monsieur says he will be here immediately. Uh, very well. I do not know, Dorant, but I feel that I'm doing a very unconventional thing to allow myself to be taken by you into this house where I know no one. What place would you have me choose then, madame, where my love may entertain you? Since, for fear of gossip, you do not wish me to use either your house or mine... You put me under obligations every day, Dorant, by forcing me to accept these two great testimonies of your love. Ah, oh, madame, those presents are mere bagatelles. I know what I am saying. And among other things, this diamond ring which you forced me to accept is of a price madame, that I... Madame, I beg you do not lay so much stress on a thing which my love finds unworthy of you. Ah, oh, here is the master of the house. Madame. <laughs> madame, the Marquis. What is this? What is he Madame. doing? Madame, those are bows. Oh. Monsieur Jourdain knows the fashionable world. Oh. Madame. Madame, it is for me a glory, great indeed, that you accord me the grace to do me the honor of honoring me with the favor of your presence. Monsieur Jourdain, enough, enough. Madame is not pleased by grand compliments. Madame, he is a good bourgeois, ridiculous enough as you see in all his manners. Madame, this is my first friend, Monsieur Jourdain. It is too much honor that you do me. A gallant man with irreproachable manners, whom I esteem most highly. Take care, monsieur. Above all things, to say nothing to her about the diamond ring that you gave her. Can I not even ask her how she likes it? Oh, by no means. That would be ill-bred. He says, madame, that he finds you the most beautiful person in the world. He is indeed gracious. Oh, madame, it is you who are gracious, then. <laughs> Shall we... Ah, uh, shall we not dine? Come, let us take our places at once and send for the musicians, Lackey. They are here already, sir. Oh, Dora. Such a magnificent repair. Madame, I only wish that it were more worthy of you. Will you be seated? As it is I who ordered this dinner, its success may be doubtful, madame. And as Monsieur Jordan has well said, I could wish that the repast were more worthy. <laughs> I reply to such compliments only by eating heartily. Ah, oh, madame, what beautiful hands you have. Mediocre, Monsieur Jordan. But you mean, perhaps, the diamond. It is very beautiful. Oh, heaven forbid my speaking of it. That would not be playing the gentleman. And the diamond is a very little thing. You are fastidious. You are too kind. Come, let us drink, Monsieur Jordan, to these musicians who do us the honor of playing for us. <laughs> the repast is marvelously seasoned. Good cheer mixed with music. And I'm admirably entertained. Madame, it is not... Monsieur Jordan, pay attention, please, to the singers. They are about to begin. Chantant les amours de Jeanne, chantant, chantant les amours de Jeanne. Oh, 
cantina sempre cabana come no palette d'orblion That was beautifully done. I do not think anyone could sing better. But here at my side, I I see something far more beautiful. Oh, Monsieur Jordan is more gallant than I thought. If I could touch your heart, I should be. Ha-ha! Ha! Ho! I find here good company. And I see indeed that you did not expect me. Is it for this beautiful affair, Monsieur, that you sent me to dine at your sister? I return to find a banquet fit for a wedding. So this is how you squander your fortune. And it's thus that you treat ladies in my absence, giving them music and play while you send me out for an airing. Madame Jordan, what are these ideas of yours? That your husband spends his money in such a manner, and that it is he who entertains Madame the Marquise? <laughs> You're wrong. It is I, Madame. He only lends me his house. You ought to consider more carefully what you say. <laughs> yes, impertinent creature. It is uh, Monsieur Le Comte who gives all this to Madame la Marquise, who is a lady of rank. He does me the honor of using my house to entertain her and of requesting the pleasure of my company. You are wasting your breath, my dear. I know what I know. What does this mean, Dora? You expose me to the insults of this furious woman? I'll take my leave. Good evening. Oh, Madame. Pull up. Madame, why are you going? Going I do not know what keeps you from hurling at your head pieces of the repast that you have broken up. I uphold my rights and everyone would support me in this. You would do well to avoid my anger, madame. Ah, 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 ah. I beg your pardon, monsieur. Oh, who is this? Uh, I do not know, monsieur, whether I have the honor of being recognized by you. No, monsieur. I knew you when you were no higher than that. Me? Uh, yes. I was a great friend of your late father. Of my late father? Yes, he was a very honorable gentleman. What is this you say? I say he was a very honorable gentleman. You knew him well? Oh, assuredly. And you knew him as a gentleman? Yeah, without a doubt. And because of the interest I take in all that concerns you, I have come to make known to you uh, the best news in the world. What is it? Uh, you know uh, that the son of the Grand Turk is in Paris? I uh, no. The Grand Turk, you say? Yes. He arrived in Paris today. He has a magnificent retinue. Everybody pays him homage, and he has been received by the king as a potentate of great importance. By my faith, I did not know that. And uh, what concerns you uh, directly, monsieur, is that he is in love with your daughter. What? what? The, the son of the Grand Turk in love with my daughter? Yes. He wishes to be your son-in-law. My son-in-law? The son of the Grand Turk? Yes. How marvelous that is. In short, he is coming this evening to ask your daughter's hand in marriage. And that he may have a father-in-law who is worthy of him, he wishes to make you a Mama Mucci. Mama Mucci? Yes, Mama Mucci. Uh, that is to say, in our language, uh, paladin. There is no nobler title in the world... And you will be the peer of the greatest lords on earth. The son of the Grand Turk honors me much. And he is coming here, you say? Yes, and he will bring everything for the ceremony of conferring on you uh, the title. Oh, all this, oh, all this embarrasses me greatly. For my wife is obstinate and insists on marrying our daughter to a, to a certain young man named Cleon. No, oh, she would change her mind when she sees the son of the Grand Turk. It's strange to say he resembles this Cleon. I've just seen Cleon. Someone pointed him out to me. Uh, the love your daughter bears for the one it can easily be transferred to the other. Oh, I hear the son of the Grand Turk coming. Yes. Uh, here he is. Uh, what he says is, Monsieur Jordan, may your heart flourish all the year like a rose tree. 
I am the very humble servant of His Highness the Turk. Austin Yog, Tetelemek. Basem Basse Allah Moran. He says, may heaven give you the strength of the lion and the wisdom of the serpent. His Highness the Turk honors me too much, and I wish him all kinds of prosperity. Bell men. He says you are to go with him to prepare for the ceremony in order that he may see your daughter and conclude arrangements for the marriage. So many things in two words. The Turkish language is like that. It says much in a few words. Go quickly. Follow where he wishes. <laughs> oh, my face, this is a roaring good joke. What a fool. If he had learned his role by heart, he couldn't have played it better. <laughs> what is this? Oh, I pray you, Monsieur Ricard, will you kindly help an affair which is to take place here? <laughs> Call me hell. Who would have recognized you dressed like that? How you are tricked out. <laughs> you know me, eh? <laughs> Well, what are you laughing at? <laughs> oh, that's something well worth laughing at, monsieur. In what way? <laughs> oh, it'll take many guesses, monsieur, for you to find out the trick we are playing on monsieur Jordan to win his consent to the marriage of his daughter to my master. Well, I cannot guess the stratagem, but I can guess that it will not fail to have its effect since you are managing it. Oh, I am sure, monsieur, that monsieur Jardin's stupidity is known to you. Yes, indeed. <laughs> I have good reason to know it. <laughs> Let me hear your scheme. Oh, eh. If you please, monsieur Lacan. Let us withdraw to make way for the masqueraders who are to gather here. You can see a part of the story while I tell you the rest. <laughs> As Comte Durant and Coviel draw to one side, there is considerable excitement on the dancing floor. The ballet is now grouped about the stage. Presently, eight tall figures in gay Turkish costumes appear with a rug, which they unroll in front of a large throne chair. Now Cleon, disguised in the royal costume of a Turkish prince, follows them and is seated on the throne. The Turks form two lines, making a lane through which a second escort of Turks conducts Monsieur Jordan to the throne. The old gentleman is bowing and scraping extravagantly. in this silly style. What impertinence is this, madame, to speak in such a manner to a Mama Mucci? What's this? I tell you I must be addressed with respect now. I have just been made a Mama Mucci. What do you mean, Mama Mucci? Mama Mucci, I say. I am a Mama Mucci. What nonsense is this? This is a dignity that has just been conferred on me by an imposing ceremony. And what ceremony, pray? Mahameta poor Jordina. What are you trying to say? Jordina, that is to say, Jordan. Well, 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 what's your name? Turker, Jordina. What are you saying? Herd of Fender, oh, Palestina. That's nonsense. Dara, dara, bastanara. What is all this jargon? Bula, bula, la, chula, la, Stop it. Stop it dancing around. Oh, my husband is mad. I go now to join the Grand Turk. Oh, he's lost his mind. He's lost his mind. I must go after him. Jordan! Jordan! 
Yes, Marquis, you will see here a most amusing thing. I do not think it would be possible to find a man more foolish than he. And then, madame, we ought to help Cleonce and his little love affair by supporting this masquerade. <laughs> I'm deeply interested in the affair. Cleonce deserves all success. Besides, we have here, madame, a ballet which is due us and which we ought not to miss. I want to see if my ideas are well worked out. <laughs> Here is Monsieur Jordan. Mamamouche. A Mamamouche. A Mamamouche. Salam. Salam. Monsieur, we have come, Madame and I, to do homage to your new dignity and to rejoice with you over the marriage you are about to arrange between your daughter and the son of the Grand Turk. Monsieur, may you have the strength of serpents and the prudence of lions. I am anxious to be the first, monsieur, to congratulate you upon the high degree of glory to which you have attained. Madame, may you flourish all the year like the rose tree. I am infinitely obligated to you for your interest in my new honor. And I'm rejoiced to see you in order to make very humble apologies for my wife's behavior. It is of no consequence. I can excuse her indignation. You see, madame, that Monsieur Jordan knows in his glory how to recognize his friends. It is the expression of a truly generous soul. Where is His Highness, the Turk? Here he comes. I've sent for my daughter in order to give him her hand. Jingle Pape Bombay Wisha Salam. Allah, Allah, ti ordina, ti ordina, salam. 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 Monsieur, we have come to do homage to your highness as friends of your father-in-law and to offer you our very humble service. Allah, bola, akreboran, jubal soten. <coughs> well, what is the interpreter? Call him. I want to tell him who you are and to make him understand what you say. Where the devil has he gone? <laughs> uh, monsieur... Uh, Monsieur is a grande signor, a grande signor, and Madame a grande dama. Monsieur le Conte, Mamamouche Francais, and Madame la Marquise, Mamamouche Francaise. I cannot speak more clearly. Yeah, uh, good. Oh, here is the interpreter. Hey, you called, Mamouche. Where have you been? Huh? We could not say anything without you. Tell your master that Monsieur and Madame are persons of high rank who have come to do him reverence as my friends and to offer him their service. Alabama, Crochet, and Alabama, Alabama. Palati, Tubal, Oran, Sotar, Omak, Utah. You see? And he says, May the rain of prosperity ever moisten the garden of your family. I told you he speaks Turk. It is wonderful. Father! Oh! How you are made up! Oh. <laughs> are you playing a comedy? <laughs> no. No, it's not a comedy. It's a very serious affair. What? Here is the husband to whom I shall give you. Me, father? Yes, you. Come, give him your hand, and return thanks to heaven for your good fortune. But I do not wish to marry. I wish it. I, who am your father. No, my dear father. I have told you that I can marry no one but Cleont, and I am resolved to suffer all extremities rather than to... What? Lucille. Oh, Cleont. Oh, well, well, it is true. You are my father. I owe you entire obedience, and it, uh, it lies with you to dispose of me according to your wish. Ah. I'm delighted to see you recognize your duty. See what it is to have an obedient daughter. What I is this I hear? Man. They tell me that you wish to give your daughter in marriage to this, this carnival maker. You be quiet, impertinent creature. You always interfere. Is there no way to teach you to be reasonable? It is you who cannot be taught reason. What sort of a marriage is this you want to make with this, this, this... I wish to marry our daughter to the son of the Grand Turk. Take him your compliments to the interpreter here. I will have nothing to do with the interpreter. But to him, I will say to his nose that he shall not have my daughter. Will you be quiet for once? Madame Jourdain, you set yourself against such good fortune as this? You refuse His Highness the Turk for a son-in-law? Sir, please look after your own affairs. It is a great honor that you are rejecting... My daughter consents to marry a Turk? Assuredly. She can forget Cleon. Yes, uh, uh, yes, mother. I would strangle her with my own hands if she did such a thing. I tell you, this marriage shall take place. And I tell you that it shall never take place, mother. Go away. You're a good for nothing. What? 
You quarrel with her for obeying me? She is my daughter as well as yours. Oh, madame. Well, what do you want to say to me? A word. I'll hear nothing. Oh, Mrs. Jordan, if she will listen to a word from me in private, I promise you that I will get her consent to what you wish. I will never consent. How obstinate women are. Will it do any harm to listen? No, listen to me. And you can do as you please afterwards. Uh, very well. Uh, we have been making signs to you, madame, ever oh. since you came in. Do you not see that we're doing all this to please your husband? That we're tricking him with this disguise? That it is Cleant himself, who is the son of the Grand Turk? Oh. And I, the interpreter, am Corviel? So? Uh, I surrender. Uh, do not give us away. No, no. <clears throat> Monsieur Jodin, I consent to the marriage. Oh. <laughs> now everyone is reasonable. Let us send for a notary. Lackey? Uh, yes, monsieur. Send someone quickly for a notary. Uh, yes, monsieur. And while he is coming, and while he draws up the contracts, let us have our minuet and entertain His Majesty the Turk. A good suggestion. Come, let us take our places. Is the ballet ready? Papa, what about Nicole? Oh, give her to the interpreter. Uh -huh. And my wife to anyone who will have her. <laughs> oh, monsieur, I thank you. A jolly trick. We have won the game. <laughs> <laughs> And that is the end of our tenth play, Moyer's famous farce, Le Bourgeois Gentilhomme, or The Would-Be Gentleman. Our next play, which will be Oliver Goldsmith's fine comedy, She Stoops to Conquer, will not be broadcast until Sunday, January 8th. We hope you are enjoying this series of great plays, and that you will be with us again in two weeks. Until then, we're hoping that you will be thrilled by a fine Christmas and a happy New Year's, and that... All your best wishes will come true. Your commentator today was Burns Mantle, American drama critic. The adaptation of Le Bourgeois Jantihum was made by Harry McFadden, who also directed the performance. The musical score was specially arranged and conducted by Joseph Haunty. The cast included... Monsieur Jordan, Charles Webster, Madame Jordan, Florence Malone, Lucille, Beatrice Miller, Doramain, Ellen Maher, Duran, Carl Benton Reed, Cleant, Raymond Bromley, Nicole, Selena Royal, Coviel, William Shelley, a music master, Harry Mustaire, a dancing master, Burford Hampton, a fencing master, William Thornton, a master of philosophy, Richard Gordon, a tailor, Don Morrison, Apprentice, Junius Matthews, and a lackey, Jerry Lesser. The Great Play Series is an educational feature of the National Broadcasting Company. A study manual, part one, giving complete background material for the Great Plays, is available to our radio audience at the cost of ten cents. It has been prepared by Blevins Davis, who arranged for the series. Send the coin or money orders to the National Broadcasting Company in care of Great Plays, Radio City, New York. Consult your local library for reading material on the remaining great plays of the series. Le Bourgeois Jantéhomme was a presentation of the National Broadcasting Company and came to you from the RCA Building, Radio City, New York.